Well, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you guys today. Good to be with you on the first Sunday in December. Turn to somebody and say, only 23 days until Christmas. But who's counting, right? I'm not counting. But uh, yeah, we are uh, getting close to Christmas time, and I love this time of the year. Unfortunately, uh, weather lately has not been December-like or Christmas-like. How many of you are enjoying the warm weather? No, 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 no. Guys, it's warm all year long in Texas. Can we at least have two months out of the year where it's a little bit cold? My kids were outside in shorts and short sleeve shirts yesterday. That's not right. I'm ready, I'm ready for some cold weather myself, but I'm glad to be in the house of God today. I want to welcome in our family over at the South Campus and everybody watching online. Can we give them a great big round of applause? We love you so much. We are one church that meets in two locations, but we have the same vision and the same heart, and we are one body. So we're glad that you are with us today. Uh, I want to remind you guys also of something else. Today uh, is step one of our Next Steps process. Maybe you've seen in the announcement videos or in posters around the campus. But our next steps are four uh, steps the first four Sundays of the month. And today is step one. They're at 1115 at both campuses. But today is Discover New Covenant, which is all about who we are as a church. It's a peek behind the scenes. It lets you know what we believe and what it means to be plugged in and to be a member here at New Covenant Church. So I want to remind you about that. And then the next three steps are really all about you to help you discover uh, how to live a life empowered by the Holy Spirit, what your gifts are, and how to use those gifts to make a difference. And so they're for you, and I want to encourage you to take advantage of that. Maybe you've been coming a little while, or you're just visiting, and you're going, I want to know more about this. We'll jump in, and, and I want to ask you to take those four steps. And if you've taken a couple of them, and maybe you haven't finished it, and you're like, well, I can't get back in now, Yes, you can. Jump in wherever you left off. That's why they're every month, the first four Sundays. So just jump back in at the step that you missed and uh, get through that because we want to help you grow. We want to help you make a difference, and that's what these classes are designed for. So I just wanted to remind you about that this morning. We are in a series called The Happiest Time of the Year. And before I get into the message today, you might think to yourself, no, this isn't the happiest time of the year. For me, many people experience sorrow this time of year because of loss or a number of other things. And I want to invite you back next Sunday because Pastor Chuck is going to be sharing about sorrow during this time of year and how to deal with that. As you, many of you might know, he has experienced, uh, our family has experienced sorrow this time of year. And so I want to encourage you to come back and don't miss that next week. Maybe invite people you know that have a hard time this year. This could really help them. But that will be next Sunday. But today... I want to talk to you about generosity. This is one of the reasons we love this time of year, isn't it? This, this is the happiest time of year because of the feeling of generosity in the air. This is my favorite time of year. I've made no secret about that. I love Christmas. I love Home Alone. I love Christmas lights. I love all of the things that come around this time of year. Why do we enjoy it so much, though? Why do we say it is the happiest time of the year? And that's because the feelings of Thanksgiving and the feelings of generosity that we experience everywhere we go, right? P people that maybe mean all year long are all of a sudden nice to you. People who are stingy all year long are all of a sudden generous, right? S complete strangers are generous and nice to you, saying Merry Christmas and opening doors and doing things for you they wouldn't normally do. And it's one of the happiest times of the year because we're actually living out and walking out godly principles of thanksgiving and generosity that we could be doing all year long. But for some reason, we pack them into just these two months of the year. And there is an innate joy in giving, isn't there? That's why there's a happy time of year. We like to give, right? There, there's a joy that comes with giving. And the Bible actually says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And that word blessed literally means happy. It means that it's happier to give than it is to receive. Because when we're only focused on receiving, we're just inward selfishly focused. But when we focus on giving and generosity, there's a joy that comes with it. And God wants us to be a generous people. In fact, generosity is one of our core values in the way that we define it is giving is the verb of the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his son. He loved so much that generosity came out of him that he gave his son Jesus. And we believe that generosity kills both greed and fear while creating an environment of faith. Because you can't be greedy while you're being generous, can you? You can't have fear while you're being generous because you'll be stingy when you have fear. But a generous person has no fear and it creates faith in you when you give. I, I love always looking up definitions of generosity or what people say about generosity. And as I was 
researching, I just looked at a number of different people's ways that they defined it. And one person said it this way, that generosity is a kind open-handedness. Kind of, I liked that, an open-handedness typically marked with liberal giving. And one person said it this way, and I thought this was great, that, that generosity, people who are generous are not attached to worldly possessions. That's so true. You can't be generous if you're attached to your worldly possessions. But God does want us to be generous. But why? What is the purpose of our generosity? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So if you want to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, I want to read to you a few verses in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and then I'm going to take some time and expound on several things within this passage. But Timothy, uh, the book of Timothy, is a letter from Paul. Paul was Timothy's mentor. And Paul wrote a lot of letters in the New Testament. Many of them were written to churches, but this one was written to a person. And Timothy was a pastor. So Paul is telling Timothy in this passage, what to tell the people in his church. So let's pick up here in 1 Timothy 6, 17. It says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them or command them not to be haughty or proud, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. What a beautiful scripture. But I know some of you tuned out in the very first words that I said. Tell the rich in this present age. Some of you were like, rich? Oh, that's not me. I don't need to listen to the rest of this, right? Some of you, if I asked you to raise your hand at both campuses if you were rich, very few, if any, hands would go up. But if I said, if you're blessed, raise your hand, almost every hand would go up, right? But we don't like to identify ourselves as rich, do we? We're like, no, that's not me. I'm not rich. Why? Because rich is relative to your current position. In other words, rich is the next level up from you, right? If we're honest, someone say, are you rich? No, I'm not rich. Bob, now Bob, Bob has more than me. Bob's rich. Or Lisa, no, Lisa's rich. I'm not rich, though. It's relative to our current. No one likes to think of themselves as rich. So the reason I I don't want you to tune out here, but I would submit to you that many of us are rich, if not all of us are rich. So today, many of you, if not all of you ladies probably, went to your closet and you looked at your clothes and what did you say? I have nothing to wear, right? And that's not what you meant. What you meant was I'm looking at all of my clothes and I can't decide what to wear. I have so much to wear, I can't decide what to wear. In fact, your clothes had a room. There's a room built just for your clothes. It's called a closet, right? Think about that. You have so many clothes, you have to build a room to store them in. But, but we all have more than we think we have. There's a website called globalrichlist.com, and you can look this up later. But in, on this website, you can go put in your income and use the U.S. currency of the dollar, and it will tell you what percentage you are of rich in the world's population. And did you know that if you make $24,000 a year, which in Texas is the poverty level, you are in the top 2% of the world's richest people. The top 2%. If you take the median household income of Gregg County, you are in the top 0.37% of the world's richest people. Why do I share all this with you? So that you don't discount what he's about to say because he's talking to us. We are rich in this present age, which also alludes to the fact that there's another age. And we're going to get to that in just a little bit. But he's telling them, listen, you who are rich in this present age. And I want you to know, listen, first of all, you don't have to be rich to be generous. Okay? Generosity has nothing to do with how much you have. It has to do with the spirit from which you give it. Okay? But you don't have to be rich to be generous. But in reality... All of us are rich in this present age compared to the world. The rest of the world, we have so much. And so we need to take heed to what the Bible says. So, and sadly, as I was studying this out, I saw from my findings that uh, many times the more people make, the less they actually give percentage-wise. And the less people make, sometimes they actually give more percentage-wise. And why is that? Because it's not tied, their, their generosity is not tied to what they have. Their hope is not in what they have. And that's what Paul is saying here. Listen, don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches. If we're honest, our, our 
riches, our worldly possessions, they're uncertain. The values can change. Your home value can go up or down. Your car value always goes down. It's a depreciating asset, right? It never gets worth more unless it's a really old classic, right? But, but most of the things we have go up and down. The stock market goes up and down. One day it can be worth a lot. The next day it can be worth nothing. The currency, even the dollar, can go up or down and could be worth nothing one day. So Paul's saying, listen, don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches in this world. Everything on this earth is going to fade. As I was a few weeks ago, just in my morning prayer time, going through the things that I'm thankful for, as I thought about everything that I was thankful for, just the thought hit me, it's all going to burn one day. It's just going to go away, my home, my car, uh, the things I, that used to entertain me. They're all going to burn. And I, I remembered a story uh, when I was a little kid, and we had an evangelist come from Los Angeles to the church here. And he was kind of a young, flashy evangelist and a great guy, but he had this huge Rolex watch. And there's nothing wrong, first of all, with a Rolex watch. I just want you to know that. I'm not saying that. But he was showing me as a kid how cool this watch was. And I just straight face looked at him and said, it's going to burn. <laughs> and uh, as a little kid, he was kind of taken back by that. But that's the reality of it. The thing that we put our hopes in or our pleasure in in this earth, it's all going to burn one day. It's really, it's really not going to last. But I want you to notice that he was telling us not to put our hope in those riches. He didn't say don't have riches. And he didn't say don't be rich because he's talking to rich people here. It's okay to have things. In fact, he goes on to say, uh, trust God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. He wants you to enjoy what you have. It's okay to have things. It's okay to be rich in this present age. Just don't put your hope and your trust in those things. Don't let those things have you. Trust God. Put your hope in God. And enjoy what God's given you. But don't consume it all. Don't use it all. God wants you to be a blessing to other people. You've heard the phrase that we are blessed to be a blessing. How many of you have heard that before, right? That comes from a promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. He said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. God wants you to have things. He's okay with that, but just understand the purpose for it. And that's why Paul goes on to say in this passage, to do good. And be rich in good works, generous and ready to share. God wants you to do good, to be rich in good works and generous, ready to share. It's okay to have the things, but understand the purpose of what you have. And if you use them for his kingdom and to advance his mission, he's going to continue to provide those things for you. That's what a blessing is. He will bless you so that you can bless others. I love this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. It says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply, and catch this, and increase your store. So he's going to supply enough for you, and he's going to increase it, of seed, your store of seed, and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way. How many of you want to be enriched in every way? Not enough hands are going up here at the North Campus, hopefully better there at the South. Y'all don't want to be enriched in every way? Or are you just not awake today? I want to be enriched in every way. So he says, you will be enriched in every way, but for what purpose? So that you can be generous on every occasion. God wants you to be enriched in every way. He wants you to be blessed, but the purpose of it so that you can be a blessing to others. So you can be generous on every occasion. But not just being generous on purpose, though. Look, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The purpose of you blessing other people and you being generous to other people is so that it will result in thanksgiving to God. God says, I want to get the glory for it. I want people to look at me. I want them to give thanks to me, not to you. I want them to see the purpose in your generosity is that I am the one that is the provider. I am the source. This is what the more is for, guys. What God has blessed us with is to be a blessing to other people. And, but with that, God doesn't care if you have things. He just wants you to understand that there's a responsibility that comes when we have things. In Luke 12, 48, the Bible says that to, to whom much is given, much is required. 
we're going to have to, to give an account for what we have and what we did with what we have. And this isn't just about money, by the way. Generosity is not just about giving money. It's about everything. It's about your time. It's about serving people with your time, giving of your time to people. It's about your physical resources, right? It, that does include money. That is, that is including being generous with your money. Now, I'm not talking about giving the tithe. Michael Jr. just says that's not stealing, okay? So that's not generosity. Your tithe is not being generous. That's just not robbing God. I'm talking about generosity with your resources to other people. If you have a home, great, have a home. Have a big home. Just use it for God. Host a life group. Lead a life group. Have people over. Counsel people. Tell them about Jesus. Use your resources to reach people. If you have a car, use your car for people. Whatever, way, whatever God has entrusted to you, just use it to advance his kingdom. Use the blessings he's given you to advance his kingdom. Your gifts. Every one of you, God has given you a gift or multiple gifts. I know so many people in our church that are so talented in so many ways. And God has put them in you, not just for you, but for others, to be a blessing to others. Many of you are gifted with leadership, with singing, with, with kids, with your hands. Use your gifts for other people. That is what we're talking about here, to advance his kingdom. So he says, do good, be rich in good works, and be generous, ready to share and look at what he says. When you're doing this, you are storing up treasure as a good foundation for the future. This is the purpose. To store up treasure as a good foundation for the future. And if we're not careful, we will just live our lives for ourselves. We'll use all of our resources, all of our time, all of our gifts on just us, on advancing us. Instead of using them to advance the kingdom. Instead of thinking about our future. Storing up treasure in your future. Now, he's not talking about retirement here. It's okay to save for retirement. I think you should do that, but he's talking about our future in heaven. He's talking about where we're going to spend eternity. We should be motivated by heaven. God has put in every single one of us eternity in our hearts, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11. He says, and he has put eternity in man's heart. We can't escape that fact. Even lost people deep down inside know that there's something more. They're still searching for what is still out there. Is there life after death? We know that there is something more in eternity, and we cannot escape it. So we should not be living just for this life. I thought about a, a great movie, Gladiator, an older movie. There was a line in that movie when the general is rallying his troops. He said to them, he said, listen, what we do in this life echoes in eternity. And this is not a Christian movie. But you can see that even in the, in the heart of every person, there's a sense that what we're doing has to matter for more than just this life. There is an eternity out there that we need to be thinking about. And that's what we have to be living for, not just this life, living for eternity. Dr. David Shibley, who's a friend of our family and a friend of this church, he wrote a book called Living as if Heaven Matters. It's a great book, keeping us focused on heaven. But he said that one of the Greek definitions of the word man or human is upward looker upward gazer in other words that each in each one of us there's a sense that we should be looking up we should be anchored upward towards heaven that our life should be focused on heaven not on this earth the future is heaven for us as believers and that's what we need to be focused on heaven is our aim we're just strangers on this earth just passing through we did a series a while back called strangers talking about how we should live differently in this world because we're not living for this world we are strangers to this world and Paul writes a letter in, in Philippians to the, the Philippian church and he is expressing his sadness for some people who are not living this way in verse 18 he said for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ their end is destruction their God is their belly and their glory is their shame with minds set on earthly things. He's not saying they literally make their God their belly, but what he is saying is that their, their appetite is only for themselves. Their appetite is for the things in this world, and they make that their God. And he's saying, but listen, that's not us. Verse 20, he goes on to say, listen, that's not us, but our citizenship is in heaven. If you are a believer, your citizenship is not on this earth. It's in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, guys, we have to remember that. That this is not our home. We should not be living for this world. And as pastors, it's one of our jobs to every once in a while remind us, including myself, hey, listen, listen, guys, listen, it's not about this life. I've got to say that to you sometimes. Listen, we're not living for this world. We're going to spend such a short time here. 
Let's not get so caught up in just living for this life. We need to be living and focused on eternity. James 4.14 puts it this way. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Our life is a vapor. It is a breath. We are here today and gone tomorrow. And I don't know about you, but when I, when I have just a little bit of money or a little bit of anything, I contemplate quite a bit how I'm going to spend it. I'm a lot more uh, cautious about where I put it. I think about wh- how am I going to use this very little bit I have. And this is kind of what James is saying here. You need to really think about your life. You have just a little bit here on this earth. In the scope of eternity, which goes on and on and on, we can't even fathom it with our human minds, our life is just but a tiny sliver. And what we can do if we're not careful is live everything for this tiny little sliver. But this isn't really our life. Our life is what happens after. That's what we should be living for, eternity, which goes on and on and on. But if we're not careful, we're focused so much on these just few years we have on this earth. We need to be thoughtful. We'd be wise to think about what we're doing with what we have on this earth. I'm reminded of this parable in Luke chapter 16. And I'm going to read it to you here in just a second or just a few verses from it. But I'm going to give you the backstory of it. Jesus is telling us a parable of an uh, unjust or unwise steward or manager. And he's mismanaging this master's resources. And so the master finds out about it, and he is going to relieve this guy from his management duties. And so this guy finds out that, that it's coming to an end for him. So what he does is he goes around and he starts cutting deals with all the people who owe the master money. He starts settling at, at a lower rate to them. He's like, hey, I'll, I'll settle your debt for like 50%, right? So he goes and he's making deals, building relationships with these people for when he doesn't have his job anymore. Now he's in good with these guys. Now look at what this says, and I'm going to read it to you out of the New Living, just these few verses, because I think it breaks it down easy for you. He says, the rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than than are the children of light. He's saying, listen, they're smarter with how they're doing sometimes with what they have around them than us as Christians. Here's the lesson, this is what he says. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into your eternal home. He's saying, listen, use what's around you. Use your possessions on this earth. Use your worldly resources to build relationships with people, in other words, uh, to help get them to your eternal home. Our eternal home is where? Heaven. If you're a believer, heaven is your eternal home. And he's saying, use what you have on this earth so when you get there, when your possessions are gone on this earth and you get to heaven, they're going to say, hey, I'm here because of you. I'm here because you gave. I'm here because you served. I'm here because you used your resources to tell me about Jesus. He said, we would be wise to think about that life more than this life because this dishonest manager was thinking about his life after his stewardship ended. And that would be wise for us to do the same. Use our resources to get to the next life. Our generosity on earth should be aimed at heaven. It shouldn't be aimed just on this earth. It should be aimed at heaven. We should be using it for our eternal life. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on this earth. Many of us know this scripture. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. In other words, he's saying, listen, I, I, know, I, I know that on this earth, it's all going to burn. Everything you have on this earth is going to end up disappearing. People can take it. So don't invest everything in this life. Don't put all of your resources into this life. Think about laying up treasures for yourself in heaven. And if I'm honest with you, people have told me this before and said, hey, brother, you're really laying up treasures in heaven. And my selfish thought was, wish I had some treasures on earth. Come on, you've thought this before too, right? Am I the only one being honest in church? It sure would be nice. Now listen, I'm, I'm an advocate for paying people on this earth. A workman is worth his wages. It's nice to receive rewards on this earth, but it should not be our motivation. If we could catch a small glimpse, just a tiny glimpse of what the treasures in heaven are, we would trade everything on this earth for it. We would trade everything. We would say, I would take that over anything on this earth any day. And Jesus is saying, listen, that's where we're going to spend eternity. You'd be doing well to think about that life more than this life. The treasures in this life are used to build treasures in that life. 
And we have to learn to think this way as believers, using our treasures on this earth, our resources on this earth, our time, our gifts, everything we have to get people to heaven. So don't invest everything into this life. That's what Paul was trying to say here. Do good. Be rich in good works. Be generous. Thus laying for yourselves up a treasure on a firm foundation. And then he says, when, you're, when you store up treasures for the future, you are taking hold of that which is true life. In other words, this is not true life. The world we're living in right now is not truly life. Heaven is truly life. Eternity is truly life for the believer. So we have to be focused there. And my job and what I want you to get is, listen, don't use everything on this earth. Be generous on purpose for eternity. Because when we get to heaven one day, we're going to have to answer two questions. Every single one of us is going to have to answer two questions. And the first one is this. What did you do with Jesus? And this is the great white throne judgment. This is what everybody will have to answer. And hopefully our answer will be, your answer will be, I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior and I live for him. He is a free gift. This is, you cannot earn this. He is the free gift of salvation. That's what we're celebrating this month is the birth of Jesus and what he did for us. That nobody can earn that. It is the free gift of salvation. But if you, say, if you are able to say that day, when he says, what did you do with Jesus? I received him as my Lord. I served him and I followed him. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your joy. Enter into eternity. What a joyous day that will be. I cannot wait for that day. But the second question is, what did you do with what I entrusted to you? What did you do with what I gave you on this earth? And that is the judgment seat of Christ. And that is for every believer. That is what we'll be judged for, what we did with what he gave us on this earth. And there's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 14, I think that explains this. It says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, that's the first one. You can't, you can't earn it. That's the foundation of Jesus Christ. No one else builds that. That is him. And then verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest on the day, capital D, that's the day of judgment that's in heaven, we'll disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. What we do on this earth will matter in heaven. What we do with what he's entrusted to us will matter in heaven. And this is why it's so important, guys, that we don't just do good, that we're not just rich in good works, and we're not just generous, but we're doing it in Jesus' name. Because whatever you build on that foundation of Jesus is what will last, is what will stand. And I want, I want you to have rewards in heaven. There are lost people who do good works. There are people who don't know Jesus that do good works and serve at soup kitchens. And if I come and I, and I give you food because you're hungry, but I don't tell you about the bread of life, what have I really done? If I clothe you, if I give you shelter, but I don't tell you about your eternal home in heaven, what have I really done? It won't stand in the day of judgment. I want you to have rewards in heaven. I want people to welcome you into your eternal home saying, I'm here because of you. We've got to do good in Jesus' name. We've got to do good works in Jesus' name. We've got to tell them the reason of why we're generous. That's my heart for you today. That's the purpose of this message today, to understand that our generosity has to have a specific purpose, and that's eternity. It is heaven that we're focused on, getting people there. Generosity on purpose is intentionally giving our time, our resources, and our gifts to get people to Jesus. That's the purpose of our generosity. And so one of the ways we want to help you make this practical is we've made these little cards. We've had these blessed cards before. We modified it based on some other things I saw that I really liked. And this one says, just a little something to show you God loves you. And on the back side, it says, and so do we. And I want you to use these cards. They're going to be in the lobby at both campuses. But be focused with your generosity this time of year. Don't just do something nice for somebody. Do something for them in Jesus' name and let them know the reason of why you are doing what you're doing. Many of you will go to a restaurant today. Take one of these cards with you. Tip your waitress or waiter really big and leave them this card and tell them about Jesus. If you're not going to tip them big, don't leave them this card and don't tell them about Jesus, okay? <laughs> Please don't hurt believers, okay? Pay for someone's meal. Buy someone's Starbucks in the line behind you and tell the person at the window, I want you to give them this and tell them that God loves them. God loves them and has a plan for their life. 
go rake your neighbor's yard, make your neighbor's cookies and give them this and say, listen, I'm just doing something for you to let you know that God loves you. Do it in the name of Jesus. Build upon the foundation of the name of Jesus. That's the point of this. Amen? Let's stand together at both campuses. And guys, I, I want you to, I want you to enjoy Christmas. I want you to enjoy the generosity that comes at this time of year. Enjoy giving gifts. It's a lot of fun to give gifts. You can even enjoy receiving them. That's okay. I'm not trying to be a downer on this Sunday, but I want you to be focused on heaven. It's where we're going to spend eternity. This life is so short. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And the older we get, the more that that becomes very clear to us. Reality begins to, to set in. But I want you to be generous on purpose. Give your time on purpose, intentionally telling people about Jesus. Give your resources, intentionally telling people about Jesus. Give your gifts, use your gifts, serve people, and let them know it's because of Jesus. We say that Jesus is the reason for the season, don't we? But let's let them know that he's also the reason for our generosity. We're not inherently generous people. It's because we have a very generous God. Amen? Let's pray together at both campuses. God, we just want to say today, we are so, so grateful for the generosity that you showed us in your son, Jesus. That's what we're celebrating this month is the birth of your son, Jesus. If you're thankful, if you are grateful for the generosity that God has shown you and he is your savior, just tell him, I thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the generosity you've shown us. You tell him with your mouth. We are so grateful. This morning as I was praying, this wasn't part of my plan today, but my heart began to break for people who would get to heaven. And on that first question, when God says, what did you do with Jesus? Some of you might not know what you could say that day. You might not be able to say, I served him, I received that free gift. Oh, I thought about you today. If that's you, this isn't a salvation message, but what better day to give your life to Jesus, to receive the free gift of salvation than at Christmas time. And if that's you at either campus or listening online, don't wait. My heart was breaking for you today if that's you. We can't escape eternity, and we won't be able to escape that judgment. And I want you to be able to stand before Jesus and say, I received you as my Lord and Savior. If that's you today, if that's you and you say, I don't know what I would say. Today, I want you to make that decision. If that's you, just with every head bowed and every eye closed at both campuses, I'm not going to ask you to come down. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. I just want you to slip your hand up and let me know. I don't know what I want to know today. I don't know. If that's you. You say, I just want to pray this prayer. Let's pray together. I didn't plan on this, but I, f I feel like the Lord is moving on people's hearts right now. Just pray. If this is you, let's all pray this. God, we, ju we just thank you for your son, Jesus. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. And we are turning, we are making the turning point today, God. We are making you our Lord and our Savior. Receive the free gift of Jesus Christ follow you with my whole life today, God. In Jesus' name.